Howdy folks, this is Checkers back again with another video on Folktale. We took a look at Folktale, oh, about a year ago, maybe a little bit less, and it's a game that I've always really admired. I think it is really actually pretty cool. It was amazing in its first iteration, and due to popular demand, the developer games foundry went and changed it from being essentially a very linear theme parkish sort of thing where you could only build in certain sections to a more open world more open experience and that takes a lot of nerve it takes a lot of belief in what you're doing and uh, i really appreciate that there are some folks who don't so if you were to look on Steam, you might find that people are impatient. I think mainly they're impatient because it shows so much promise. And, well, because people are impatient for anything, probably including the burning out of the sun. For me, though, I really do admire Folktale, and I'd really like to take another look at it. So here we are, and we are going to fire up the tutorial so that we can brush up on our Folktale. And, hey, there was a pro tip. You cannot build armor from rocks. Important safety tip. And... Very excited to see how this has changed. With things that are in long and changing developments, I like to take time between visits. Mainly because I get excited too. I really want to play it, but... So I don't want to, you know be constantly pecking and poking at it but I always do like checking in okay so this is the story of a guy called Bob it could easily have been about Bob's sister Gertrude but instead she was in the next room shooting people in the face and screaming a lot Bob was an intrepid village builder some might argue a control freak with a desire to boss about little people while they did his bidding nevertheless Bob was eager to learn like all omnipotent gods, Bob needed to move freely over the land, otherwise he'd be stuck looking at the same piece of sodden grass for a very, very long time. The edges of the screen seemed like a fine place to explore with a mouse pointer, the physical embodiment of all that was Bob. Bob also had a hand, a mighty hand that could click and hold things down like the mouse that lived on his desk. It wasn't long before Bob learned to hold down the middle button and drag his mouse to pan the camera. Pushing buttons was soon to become Bob's forte. Holding down none while moving the mouse along his desk led to a rather astonishing discovery. Bob could rotate the world. Now, it may be none because I've remapped it, or it may be none because it is changing. I'm not entirely sure which, but we'll play around with a few keys, and if I hit on anything, I will let you know. Not yet, anyway. Okay, the previous evening, Bob had been loitering in a local tavern when he overheard chatter of a mystical cog on the top bar, a cog so powerful it contained the very means by which to change how the world itself was viewed. Let's check that cog out. There might very well be a key binding cog. You know what? Ooh, right there. Let's look for rotate. Q and E. Okay, being as left-handed as I am, I would not have sought those out. That is not their fault. Okay, let's see. Eyesight could be improved, ears made more sensitive, and even Bob's mouse could be tweaked. Exciting stuff, thought Bob. Maybe something to explore later. It was time for Bob's first epiphany. There would be many that day, too many for a lesser god to process. But Bob was no ordinary god. Bob was smart. Bob would cope. This was not the day that Bob would rage quit. Clicking the primary mouse button on a villager caused something peculiar to happen. Yep. Villagers would say something as if waiting for a divine command. Spurred on by his discovery, Bob right-clicked the ground a short distance okay. away. Lo and behold, the villagers started running. Now, if only Bob could get the villagers to do something useful, like foraging for berries or chopping down trees, that truly would be remarkable. Huh? Here are some what? berries. All right, my love. All right, dear. Equal do? distribution of work here. Okay. 
And we are now on the hunt for 10 berries, which we can see up here, and 25 wood, which we can see here, as opposed to planks, which are processed versions of wood. What is this? Culture. Population, 4 of 10, as opposed to 410, I'm guessing. Or maybe it's four of zero because we don't have anyone to hold. You like any cottages or anything yet? Anyway, we have 40 berries. Wow, we're good. Five planks. More villagers would need roping in to help. Holding down the primary mouse button and dragging the mouse, Bob drew a selection box that selected all the subjects caught within. Bob's cup was overflowing with this sort of self-initiative, the kind that would no doubt land the villagers in grave peril. Okay, we've got our berries. I suppose what we could do is invite this fella over here. Actually, this is a tree. And we'll let, we'll let Gloriana continue. Gloriana the Hairy continue to forage for berries. Having observed the lazy villagers taking forever to perform even the simplest of tasks, Bob was determined to find a faster route to achieving world domination. Perhaps if a villager dedicated themselves to woodcutting in time, they would become better at it. They'd need somewhere to work from, and a woodcutter's hut seemed like just the place. Unusually, Bob had studied the manual before starting and knew that the woodcutter's hut could be found by pressing the hammer icon in the center of the top bar. Okay, if I were a woodcutter's hut, I'd probably look something like that. Where is a good amount? Oh, here is definitely a good amount of trees. Where, though, is a good place for our new hut? How about right there? And you. Yes, Petal. I don't know why, but I really like it when they say that. Okay. Come. Eloise the Mange, you shall become our woodcutter. Open up construction options. We've already done that, and we've got our hut on the move. And it seems that as villagers finish their current task, they will rush off to help. Let's see if they'll go back. We'll keep an eye on this fella right here. I'm keeping Eloise the Mange on my mouse because I promised her she could become a woodcutter. Building complete. Okay. And open construction options. Oh, it's still waiting for me to do that. Buildings were organized into basic, military, and advanced. Such a simple thing as chopping wood could be found under the basic group, no doubt with a big X on it. But why did the hut change color from green to red as it moved around the landscape? That was a good question, thought Bob in a self-congratulatory way. Perhaps red indicated something was blocking construction and that green meant all was well again. It seemed so obvious with hindsight, as did right-clicking to cancel construction. And we have built us a woodcutter's hut. Bob took a moment to admire the new woodcutter's hut. It was a fine achievement, something to be really proud of. Now, if only Bob could find a way to train a few woodcutters. Yes, and here is Eloise, who I promised an education. Right away. And we'll grab also Rufus de Grey. Okay, thanks to Bob's leadership, woodcutters could now chop down trees, making planks for construction and firewood for warmth. The peasants were pleased mostly because they no longer had to do it. Bob was rewarded with 75 planks for a job well done. Safe with the knowledge of at least one way of training professions and that woodcutters would replant seedlings for sustainable forestry, Bob was filled with the confidence to try something new. Bob wanted more followers, edging slowly but surely towards becoming a control freak. Building cottages for his little people to live in seemed like a positive move. An even better idea would be to build the cottages close to the woodcutter's hut so peasants wouldn't have to carry firewood quite so far build two cottages. So shall it be done. Oh, we're already there. Cottage. And let's face the inner circle here as a stylish village. 
circling the wagons. We need two cottages, right? Um, let's see. Maybe opposing cottages here. Looking upon each other with grace across the land. So... We've got 132 berries. This fellow is still cutting down trees. After he gets his load of wood there, we will drag him off for another task. We'll assign him to berries. Tricky Mowbray. Okay, Tricky Mowbray, you're off on berry detail. Leaving Gloriana the Hairy to construct the cottage on her own. So let's keep an eye on this number up here. And if the cottage completes and it goes to something other than a line and a zero, it will be not four of ten, but four of zero. And we'll have elevated it to something new, like four of five. And Gloriana races over past the supply wagon to crank off another hut. You go, girl. Okay. Our woodcutters are busy cutting wood as woodcutters do cut arrived, wood. Looking for a fresh start. Well, that's good to know. Construct one of two cottages, and now with three folk working on them, we are constructing mightily. Looks like metal, maybe. A building and stone. has been constructed. Noticing the numbers on the top bar next to the chubby villager face, Bob immediately recognized the first number to be the current population. With brain cogs now whirring almost uncontrollably, Bob deduced the second number must surely be housing capacity, as each newly constructed cottage caused it to increase by five. I'm impressed, Bob, said the imaginary voice speaking inside his head. Clearly you are meant for great things. Bob smiled, but only a little. Now, Bob, if you want to attract new folks, you need to make this a happy place. Continued the voice, Bob knew just where to look and opened the civics menu by clicking on the weighing scales icon on the top bar. Wow, so many widgets and tabs, it was almost overwhelming. Bob regained composure and soon figured out that villagers had needs and failing to meet those needs would have dire consequences. Bob had acquired the power to ration subjects, controlling their greed during times of trouble. I could also be generous, thought Bob. Surely that would make the needy sods happier. Has attracted new settlers. Indeed it would, Bob. But the stores would empty pretty fast, so let's not go there, replied the imaginary voice of reason. To help Bob out, things would flash from time to time. Yellow warned that Bob was heading for trouble, while the red meant... There was a problem requiring immediate attention. Meh, I'm not bothered about this, thought Bob. In time, Bob would learn this to be a moment of exceedingly poor judgment as the villagers rebelled and burned all his hard work to the ground. Let us take a look here. No more plus five happiness of rude variety. So we've only got berries, not making anyone happy. Ooh, taxes, proclaimed Bob, as he grinned with glee at the thought of coffers brimming with gold. I could fund research, construction, and crafting. If only I had more gold. Let's tax the bstar.st. Um, you know what? I don't need at symbol. RDS. Bastards. Okay, I know what the word is. Howled Bob without a moment's thought to how it might impact happiness. But I'm not Bob, so I'm not going to do that. Bob was eager to learn when the next golden-laden villagers would arrive and clicked frantically to the second tab. Population expands progress. A green bar indicates that new villagers will soon arrive in the village, while a red bar indicates that the villagers are unhappy and may start abandoning the village. The rate of expansion is determined by villager happiness. Bob had discovered the population progress bar. Green must mean villagers were closer to arriving. Red, growing unhappiness and the chance of rebellion and villager departures. Perhaps Bob was meant to tweak rationing and taxation until the green bar was growing. Of course, that would only happen if there were enough cottages and housing capacity. Otherwise, the bar would remain a rather dull and lifeless gray, which it does because we are at 10 of 10, not wishing to miss out on any knowledge. Bob clicked the final tab. 
Aha. This looked like an overview of my village, thought Bob. A list of buildings, current research, and yet another means of training professions. There were even icon buttons that allowed Bob to inspect individual buildings before returning to the list. This was a welcome addition indeed, and somehow felt familiar. Let's take a quick look at this. Upgrades. Huh. Okay. Um, close the civics dialogue. Let's take a look at our woodcutter's hut. Workers, research. Okay. Jumping ahead. Close the civics dialogue. Yes, Bob. With coffers slowly filling with a trickle of coin, Bob was keen to put his newfound wealth to work. Clicking the primary mouse button on the woodcutter's hut, presented four icons, the first of which would open the building dialogue, allowing Bob to delve deeper into the inner workings of the building. The workers tab was split into two panels. On the left, the current vacancies, here I guess, and our current workers. If Bob had been a good pupil, two of the vacancies would now be filled with woodcutters with two further vacancies available to be filled. Workers could be selected by clicking their portrait with the primary mouse button and either demoted or found by clicking the buttons below. Well, look at that. Okay, and to the right were Bob's available peasants. Clicking the plus sign would instruct the peasants to head to the building for training. Having discovered yet another way to train peasants, Bob's mind was blown. Following a short trip to the local hospital to have the pieces of brain reassembled, Bob returned to spot an option for enabling auto-recruit. Checking it would cause all available vacancies to be filled as soon as peasants became available. Interesting. Interesting. Oh, you can even select how... Is that what, I, I'm, what I'm seeing? You can select how many you would taught or recruit? Uh, what was that? Research tab. Okay, let's do that then. This was more like it, thought Bob. After clicking to the research tab, spending gold on research could improve buildings, make workers more efficient, and unlock crafting recipes. It all looked worryingly expensive. Luck was with Bob. At that very moment, a rich benefactor stepped forward and donated enough gold to begin researching sawmilling. Fortuitous timing indeed. Research would only progress with one or more workers assigned to the building. More workers would complete the research task in less time. And let's research sawmilling. Time of 20, perhaps, seconds, not sure, time units of some sort, and 500 coins. More than 20 seconds. Maybe that is based off of the number. If it was four, it would be 20 seconds. If we had four people in the hut, not sure. But we'll let sawmilling sawmill as sawmill instructioning and researching will do. Look at all those peasants just standing there, not doing nothing. Come over here, peasants. Find ye some berries. You're eating food, but you're not picking any up. Those are not berries. Yes, my dear. Hmm. Or maybe it's simply because we have the hut window open. Lucky you peasants just hanging out there eating berries like bonbons while we research sawmilling. Muriel Marybell. That's a nice name. To find Muriel a good job. That tree just kind of disintegrated a bit. Okay. When research completed, it was removed from the list and moved to the top right of the dialogue. Hovering the mouse pointer over the small icons would provide details of what research had been completed so far. Okay. Ah, I see. Research completed in one hut would benefit any current or future woodcutter's huts and workers. Comfortable with how it all worked, Bob proceeded to click on the upgrades tab. And so we shall. Although it was too far, far, sorry, far too early to upgrade the woodcutter's hut, it was important for Bob to know that it was possible and what would upgrading do. 
allow us to support four more workers, grant access to more advanced research, and reduce the fire risk by 50%. And requires what? 200 culture. Interesting. A culture requirement. 300 gold, 400 wood. No, planks, I'm sorry. And 200, looks like, is this stone blocks? So maybe finished? I don't know if stone goes straight to blocks or not. Anyway, maybe we'll learn. Upgrading buildings would support more workers, unlock further research, and reduce the risk of fire. Explaining what I've already looked at, which is fine. I'm jumping ahead. The tutorial is actually doing a really good job, I think. Upgrades would become available when the culture score passed the stated level, and Bob had required resources available. Bob clicked on the crafting tab. Okay, buildings such as the blacksmith had far more crafting options. The woodcutter's hut had just one, the conversion of planks into firewood. This didn't seem particularly useful when all was well in the village. Bob was a wise leader, though, possessing the foresight that if firewood stocks were to run out, being able to chop up planks would provide welcome relief against the cold and most certainly help prevent a catastrophe. Rebelling peasants with burning torches, a compulsion towards arson, and the availability of thatched roofs sprang to mind. Shaking the image out of his head, Bob clicked on the equipment tab. Equipment stores helped ease the management burden from Bob's broad shoulders. Rather than equipping each worker individually, Bob could open the master inventory panel and simply drag gear into the equipment store tab. Workers would automatically equip the best gear available. There was nothing Bob hated more than choresome micromanagement. He was mildly pleased that someone hidden away in a back room sat huddled over a box pushing buttons had thought this through. And I'm going to take a moment to pause and say that for myself. Now, understand, we can actually change the equipment of these woodcutters. And that's really pretty cool. That is one of the things that has really, you know, made me awe in wonder of this game for quite a while now. It's sort of a mix of Diablo and RPG and RTS and a city builder and I think it's really cherry-picked the best things out of those. Very exciting. Okay, continue. By now, Bob was growing impatient, yearning to return to construction and adventure. It was time to leave the bean counting behind. It was all going rather well, but villagers would only put up with eating berries for so long. A little variety wouldn't go amiss and would improve villager happiness. It was high time. Bob imparted some of his divine wisdom by providing the good folk with knowledge of farming, starting with a windmill. Build ye a windmill worthy of Mordor. Okay, let's see here. Um, we want to build all ye peasants. And... The mill shall be a mill of wood. And here we will deposit our windmill. And look at it fly up. Building completed. Okay. Train a farmer. Robin Shafton, come on down. You're the first farmer in our tutorial visit. While surely a great feat of architecture and construction, a windmill without wheat fields was about as useful as a grave robber at a crematorium. Bob set about organizing his underlings to construct several wheat fields. Okay. Without being prompted, Bob built the fields close to the windmill. Trying to do otherwise would be folly, as the lazy farmers would simply turn a blind eye rather than walk all that way. And let's see, farmer's field. And we can rotate by just kind of holding down the left mouse button. And get ourselves a nice placement. Three fields. Okay, can we squeeze one back here? We can. Perfect. Actually, that's kind of cool. Farms kind of tend in the real world to go where farms will fit. I like it. I like it a lot. A building okay. has been constructed. 
three fields we have, can we tell cell, full health, wheat, or carrots? Construction completed. Wheat didn't just magically appear, it would take some time to grow, and unless Bob expected the villagers to eat flour, which quite frankly sounded revolting, there was just enough time to build a bakery. Bake at least one bread. Okay, bakery. I think bakery is maybe going to be something other than a basic building, because I've played the game before, too. Bakery is here under advanced buildings and a pretzel. Let's put our pretzel production facility somewhat close. I don't think we want to run over these red things. They might be something useful to us at some point. Can we turn the bakery that-ish away? It is bigger than I think it is. Okay, well, that is not necessarily a problem. It's just a solution waiting to be found. Actually, let's turn that red. I don't want to eat that stone there. So let's put our bakery right there. Oh, we're going to be eating up those berries. That's okay. Who is oh, this? Nice. Muriel. Muriel, we're going to find you a great job because you have a cool name. Huh? You there, Daniel Leafbottom. Completed. Can you not Ta -ta. gather ye berries while ye may? Or are those berries already... Okay. Uh, gathered. There's some berries you can gather. Muriel, I said I'd get you a good job. Okay. How about Baker? You'll have to get up early, but your place is going to smell divine. Okay, so we're off to bake some bread, which will happen when our farmer has ground up some flour from our wheat. And here is our supply wagon. I don't know if we can actually look and see what we have. We can. Look at that. Basic clothing, berries. We've got some iron ingots, some planks, some gold, some stone blocks, and some firewood. Can we tell what's going over here? Going on over here. Not a trained farmer. But aha. Upgrades, equipment. Hmm. I'm not entirely sure how we determine. Oh, our field here is at 72%. This one's at 100%. This one's at 37 So his first harvest will be from here. I didn't quite catch that. Dial for pizza. Okay. We're, we're working on getting you yummies. Better yummies. Pretzels. Not pizza, but pretzels. Maybe if you're inventive, you could make a berry pretzel pizza. Crops be sold. Okay. A real man has a Experience, maybe? This green bar? Or something else? Health and maybe energy for skill usage for other classes, perhaps. Not sure. Okay, but here is Muriel picking up a bag of flour. Let's zoom on in. See what's going on here in Muriel land. You are standing in the work table, sunshine. That is not going to help anybody. Bakers would collect flour and water and bake it into bread with more than just berries to eat. Villager happiness would soon be on the rise. Bob took a moment of quiet contemplation to appreciate all that he had achieved. Having mastered construction and economy, Bob felt the overwhelming desire to head out in search of adventure. With precision timing as if he'd been listening to the story unfold all this time, the hero Sir Gregory wandered into town. Hey there, look at that. Submitting entirely to Bob's will, Sir Gregor Gregory possessed special abilities that would appear around his portrait in the bottom of the lef left of the screen. So we have Iron Skin, Power Slam. Let's see, Iron Skin, uh, transform your skin to be hard as iron. So basically a defense buff, Power Slam, 
Offensive skill slams opponents to the ground, dealing 50 physical damage. Shield bash. Bash opponents with a crushing blow that stuns them and deals 25 physical damage. Taunt says something about everyone's mother, which causes enemies to attack this character for 10 seconds. And Decisive Victory leaps into the air to deliver a devastating final blow, dealing 200% of normal attack damage to a target with less than 20% health. Otherwise, deals 150% of normal attack damage. Okay. Many of Sir Gregory's abilities would become useful in combat when they could be targeted at enemies. Experimenting with Sir Gregory's first ability, Bob discovered that some abilities could be used at any time. Although why you would want iron skin during peaceful times is beyond me. Imagine the weight of carrying that around while you did the grocery shopping. I digress. Sir Gregory would head off over the bridge in search of the unknown in the direction of the quest marker that had thoughtfully been added to the minimap. However, for us, this will be a pausing point and we will return next time and delve deeper into the tutorial of Folktale. I have to say, I am still completely enamored of the game and it is coming along really nicely. So we will pause here with Sir Gregory on the bridge, looking forward to visiting our quest marker next time. For the moment though, I would like to point out that if you look in the upper right hand corner, you will see a small letter I with a white circle around it. These are cards and links to other videos that I've made. Also, I have a Twitter link in the description of the video and on my channel's main page. If you're on mobile, it'll be on my channel's about page. I would like to thank you guys for being the best community out there. Truly, you guys are awesome and you make this an absolute joy to do. And I really, really want to thank you for that. I would also like to thank you for watching. I hope you found the video entertaining and maybe just a little informative. I would like to invite you to subscribe, like, and share if you so desire, and to ask you, above all, to please take care.